I've always had a great interest in ancient Egypt, ancient history from being a child because my father, and this is back in Nottingham, my father actually used to tell stories of Robin Hood, King Arthur and various different mythical people or, you know, mysteries. And from then, uh, you know, basically when I got married and met my wife and moved over to Ireland and we moved into Swords, I was actually interested in the Celtic side of history uh, for Ireland. So I started researching a few of these things and I came across a connection with ancient Egypt. And of course that, you know, pricked up my ears. And so like all of a sudden I was there. Wow, this is amazing. I've got to look into this. And that's where I started. The lead into the Egyptology part of it was that I was actually invited by somebody I knew um, who was a publican, Sam Moorhead, very interesting character. And he came from a little village called Clonigall in Wexford. Now, I'd never heard of it. I'd never heard of Huntingdon Castle and I'd never heard of a lady, Olivia Durden Robertson. And she was the head of the Fellowship of Isis. And he said, could you please come down and meet her one day? So I did. He said that she was a very eccentric woman that didn't suffer fools gladly. So, you know, you might only be hello and five minutes in there and be shown the door as such. And I went in and such a fascinating woman I have never met in years. And we hit it off straight away and we spoke for hours. She made me lunch that went on to tea and it was seven o'clock. Lady Olivia, she was very much into the Egyptian end of things. And she sort of like spoke a little bit about her interest in ancient Egypt connected to Ireland. And then I mentioned that I'd seen a couple of um, things basically that linked towards the Tuatha de Danann, who were the original sort of like inhabitants of Ireland, presumably. And she was fascinated by that and arranged to meet again. And that was the start of where I really got fascinated and interested into and started doing more research on that. When I was uh, to like researching all this, I first of all started to actually look at the historical aspects and if anything had been done or it was there any actual academic study towards it. And that's where I came across in the 1950s, Trinity College archaeologist was actually digging on the Hill of Tara. He was actually digging a second trench that was on the what's known as the Mound of Hostages. And there they found a small skeleton. And the small skeleton they thought at first was either a child or a young person, a female, but it wasn't. When an anthropologist looked at it, it was actually a baboon or an African ape. And they were fascinated by this because its depth of where it was, was out of place. It shouldn't have been that depth. So it was like at least hundreds of years old. But when they actually had it carbon dated, they found that it was from around 1350 BC. So that's 1350 years before Christ, which was a fascinating thing. They continued digging and they actually then came across a skull and a small burial site and beside that a skeleton that was separate. So the skeleton and skull were separate, but in the grave goods were some gold and some finine beads, which are a ceramic bead that were part of this burial necklace, which again was high technology for that area. And they discovered that when they actually researched or tried to find more about these beads and the gold goods, they uh, sent it to Trinity College for examination. And the chemical structures of these beads were the same, exactly the same, up to 95% of um, the same as Egyptian beads. So they were actually made in Egypt. And when they actually had a look at the beads and compared them with the burial sites of Tutankhamun, they actually found that they were an, an, you know, an identical set, if you will. So they knew that they were actually made in Egypt. They knew they came from Egypt. But again, what were they doing in Ireland in the Tomb of Hostages? And this is where, I suppose, there was more research and fascination about it because there were already ancient uh, Irish myths about Queen Scotia who was presumably somebody who came from the West and she was part of this, uh, you know, I suppose, warrior race that came from the West in magical boats and they were uh, escaping war and famine. Now, 
when research was done on Queen Scotia, they noticed that actually her father was called, because it's, it's actually written in the, um, the actual stories of this, that she went to Scotland first and then came over to Ireland. And her father was called Anais. And Anais was actually an Egyptian name for Akhenaten, which is, again, Tutankhamun's father. And his wife was Nefertari. His sister and first wife of Tutankhamun was Queen Kia. And the other wife was called Menatatan. That's her name. But actually, when Tutankhamun was killed, when the father Akhenaten died first, and then he took the throne, he died very young, about the age of 18. And Queen Kia and Nefertari took the pharaoh ship in Egypt. Menatatan had to flee with her people and she would, was actually betrothed to somebody from the West. It doesn't state who, but this was a priest. This is in the priesthood records in ancient Egypt. So it's in the Egyptian museum. You can actually see the hieroglyphics of it and a translation. And it said that because she was actually marrying some from, someone from the West and she was going to a new land, they called her Queen Scotia. So her name was actually Meritaten and Queen Scotia are the one and the same person. So she went with her people over to Scotland, first of all, and that's where the name Scotland gets its name. And also she went to Ireland because she was heading for this new land or Nova or New Scotia, which again is Canada, Nova Scotia. But she uh, fell foul of something in Ireland where the prince had died. She was with child. She um, married shortly thereafter, one of the high kings of Ireland, and they were actually fighting with a chieftain from the north. And there was a great battle that took place in Tralee, around Kerry Tralee area, and it is called, you know, the Grave of Scotia. She was actually killed, and the child was killed, in the battle. And obviously the, the, the rest of the, you know, Scotia's people fled in their boats to presumably Nova Scotia but she was actually buried there and there are um, rocks and hieroglyphics. There was reputed to be, um, there was a farmer that actually had dug up what was part of a pinnacle or a, you know, like an obelisk yeah. with hieroglyphics on it, but that's gone missing. Nobody seems to know where that was and they don't know whether it was you know, fake or fable, but there was a record of it at one stage. And that's where I suppose, the most fascinating part is that you start to get into this thing of, well, why did why would someone like Queen Scotia, Akhenaten's time, which again, oddly enough, Akhenaten, his his reign was around eighteen uh, one one thousand eight hundred and fifty BC, which is the same time as the prince who died, and the same time as Queen Scotia, so you find that that all links up. But why would she actually come to Scotland and to Ireland? Other than the fact that they knew there was a place there, they knew there was friendly people there. Now, where they got that from was because that same priesthood, which was Methanoron, he wrote that in the kingship, the Tutha Dedanon, or the Tutha, the people of Toth, were moving westward to a land that was actually of milk and honey, in other words, a vast empire, and they were heading that way. In Ireland, you had the structure of the land of saints, saints and scholars, and the land of saints and scholars was the Christian era. Prior to that, you had the Celtic era, which was, again, it's been loosely connected or connected with the Moors and North Africa. But prior to that, you had myths and legends, and the Tutha Dinanan and the Fomorians were two tribes that actually ruled Ireland. The Fomorians, there's very little information of where they came from, so presumably they were already in Ireland. The Tutha Didanan came from the west, and they came on magical ships, and they were actually very powerful, not only in architecture, medicines, sciences, mathematics, and stars, reading stars and, and navigation, but their technology was very high, presumably. And they actually set up with the uh, Fomorians, the north and the south, divided Ireland in two. And they would meet two or three times a year in the hill of Tara and negotiate any problems or issues. And hence, that was where the middle was. So you had Upper Ireland and Lower Ireland. 
and the middle was Tara. In ancient Egypt, you had Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, and the middle was Memphis, which was the head where everybody used to meet and sort out any problems or issues. So you find that the Tuta Didanen were there at the very first part of Ireland, ancient Ireland, and therefore they set up um, the structure of how the Celts would actually move forward and come in. Now, the Fomorians and the Tutha Dedanon did fight at one stage, and it's in the ancient sagas of Ireland, and they said that the Fomorians eventually beat down the Tutha Dedanon, and they actually left in their sailing ships, or their ships that flew, and they went to the west. So it seems that they did go on to Nova Scotia, to America, and inhabited there. When we look at the ancient Egyptian culture, the Irish culture, and the Celtic, and also the Tutadida, the mystery, all of them are connected because they're all connected by people. And people want to tell their story. People want to tell where they came from, who they're connected to, and that's why we're even today, oh, are you one of the O'Connors of, you know, Barristown? Or, oh, no, no, oh, you're one of the Barretts of wherever. It's because we're saying, I'm part of a clan, I'm part of this. And so we must be always asking questions about history, asking questions about, so when someone has a story, you say, wow, that's a great story. Where did that come from? How did you get to that point? Because the more we ask, the more we actually start to know and we can put things together ourselves.